So this is a work by Douglas Huber called Crocodile Tears. And this is a, a very interesting story. There is a story of a very, very talented painter who was technically extremely uh, good, extremely gifted, but artistically he was not really able to come up with a body of work that would thrive in the milieu of conceptual art. So he has dedicated the most of years of his life to teach and to teach technical, uh, the technical principles of artworks, but especially to correct already existing artworks, uh, very famous artworks. So this, this painter, this artist, he is a corrector. So here we can see his correction of uh, Mondrian's painting. You can see here in a poster, that's the original, uh, in a poster from the Museum of Modern Art, New York, from MoMA. And you can see here, it's the improved version. This is how Mondrian's painting should look like if it would be done technically correctly. So you see there are some more lines. The composition is how it's supposed to be. And the story of the, of the big corrector, the big improver that took this quest to, to make the technically right art, I thought of the story of another corrector, of another improver. So it doesn't have so much to do with the cybernetics of the poor. This would be a cybernetics of the rich. But the interesting thing about this story is that these improvements, they are also uh, not asked for. So this is the story of uh, Jan Antonin Batya. So maybe you know Tomasz Batya the big uh, shoe factory owner in former Czechoslovakia. And his brother, uh, Jan Antonin Batya, he was a visionary. He developed uh, different uh, plans of, of, and one of them, one of his uh, major works was the plan to adapt Czechoslovakia, all the infrastructure of the country, this is the year of 1937, to accommodate 40 million people instead of 16 million people. And the fascinating part about it is that Czechoslovakia didn't have a space problem Czechoslovakia didn't have more than 16 million people. And until nowadays, it doesn't come close to, to this number. But Jan Antonin Batya, he's also a corrector. He's also an improver. So I'm going to read from his own writings uh, from 1937. It's called, We are building a state for 40 million people. And I wanted the big art corrector, I wanted to let him know the story of this big urban planning and capitalist development corrector and optimizer. The lands of Bohemia, Moravia Silesia, Slovakia and Carpathian Ruthenia are indeed limbs of the one and same living organism. Nevertheless, the connections between these single limbs is strangled and this strangulation prevents a singular and healthy bloodstream. They are similar to a living body, in which veins located in important places are tightly tied. Can life in this body be entirely healthy when its unique and life-giving substances cannot flow from one part to the other through veins and arteries? This organism has to naturally suffer from overpressure in some limbs and from malnutrition in other. Our apprenticeship time is reaching its end. Take a look at Europe of the year 1937 and you will recognize that apprentices don't thrive anymore in it. Year after year, Europe is changing into a system of nations built in a truly modern way. Nations connected by perfect automobile roads, nations permeated by the most direct railroads, 
nations economically strengthened by systems of merchant navigation canals. In this Europe, we won't stand up as apprentices anymore. We will only be able to secure our political and economical independence if we drop our apprenticeship in decision and really stand upon our own feet like young entrepreneurial masters. If we want to launch ourselves into the real construction of this state, we have to primarily, through a reliable analysis, point out tasks, develop a time plan for their realization, and find those who are able to take responsibility for its implementation. I will attempt this analysis through the following chapters of this book. Our task, to build a strong and economically unified nation. Our goal, that this nation be culturally and economically the healthiest, strongest and wealthiest nation in Europe. It is possible to reach this goal. Culturally, we already reached such a level that makes us be a knowledge between the most advanced and most developed European nations. We can also reach the first place in the economical level. Our lands are rich natural gifts. Not only Czechoslovakia is able to support the life of today's 16 million inhabitants, Czechoslovakia is able to support 40 million people. We reach a similar number if we compare the area and the population density of Czechoslovakia and of, Bil uh, and of Belgium. Belgium, for an area of 30,500 square meters, has a population of 271 inhabitants per square meter a total of 8,248,000 inhabitants. Czechoslovakia, for an area of 140,400 square meters and a density of 271 inhabitants per square meter, should have 38,048,400 inhabitants, which again matches our estimative of 40 million people. So, 16 million people wrong, 40 million people right. This is our work, NOVA, done together with the artists Alicia Rogalska and Vanya Smiljanic. We've made a podcast, an interview with Michael Simko. You can listen to it in the website of the Kunsthalle Wien. So I'm not going to guide you through our work. I want instead here to show you uh, our neighbor, the work of Agnieszka Kurant. And I thought it's also um, a good neighbor. I. To, to the story of Batya. And from the story of Batya, I also thought about the story of Ford. And in the work of uh, Agnieszka, there is a, an archaeological artifact, an, an artwork, but also an archaeological artifact that is composed of uh, different parts of uh, Fordite. Uh, Fordite is a, is a gem. It's um, an artifact of industrial archaeology. These are uh, paint drops uh, from uh, the car factories in Detroit. These are paint drops already from, I think, the, the many of the ones that have been extracted, so to say, are uh, quite old, from the, some from the 50s, 60s, but even older. So these are residues of paint that have uh, become solid. They've become uh, solid enough to be worked as a stone. So in a certain way, they have uh, stonified, they've petrified. So it's, um, nowadays it's also used to, to make jewelry. So you, you polish the, the Fordite, or the co also called the uh, Detroit uh, agate. And uh, apparently also through the through the kinds of color that you find, you can date it. You can also see to uh, which cars were produced, uh, which car brands, uh, which color was, which colors were used uh, mostly. 
and yeah, I'm not an expert, but I've read that uh, lots of oranges and yellows, they were usually used to, to paint the municipal cars. And then the newest versions, they have lots of silvers and blacks. And it's also corresponds of this um, car, um, car paint, uh, car color trend. And for, for this piece uh, of Ford Diet, for Anishka Kuren's work, I thought of a poem, I think I have it here. Yes, thought of a poem of a Brazilian uh, poet, Brazilian modernist poet, uh, Carlos Drummond de Andrade, say it in uh, Portuguese from Portugal, but Carlos Drummond de Andrade. Uh, and it's a poem about, about the eternal. And it's about this uh, moment of eternal as being a moment of intensity, kind of reminds of, uh, of Foucault and, and his archive uh, that's made through the repetition of statements to the uh, frequency of statements. And this uh, eternity, this one is made uh, through a moment of intensity and a moment of intensity that, that petrifies. Um, Drummond de Andrade also call it Eternite, Eternici. And I'm going to read it in Portuguese, in Portuguese from, from Portugal. And then I'm going to, to give you some uh, prose uh, translation for the subtitles. Eterno. E como ficou chato ser moderno, agora serei eterno. Eterno, eterno. O padre eterno, a vida eterna, o fogo eterno. Le silence éternel de ce espace infini m'effraie. O que é eterno, Yaya Lindinha? Ingrato é o amor que te tenho. Eternalidade, eternite, eternaltivamente, eternoávamos, eterníssimo. A cada instante se criam novas categorias do eterno. Eterna é a flor que se fana, se soube florir. É o menino recém-nascido, antes que lhe deem nome e lhe comuniquem o sentimento do efêmero. É o gesto de enlaçar e beijar na vista do amor às almas. Eterno é tudo aquilo que vive uma fração de segundo, mas com tamanha intensidade que se petrifica e nenhuma força o resgata. É a minha mãe que em mim que eu estou pensando, de tanto que a perdi de não pensá-la. É o que se pensa em nós se estamos loucos. É tudo que passou porque passou. É tudo que não passa, pois não houve. Eternas as palavras, eternos os pensamentos e passageiras as obras. Eterno, mas até quando? É esse marulho em nós de um mar profundo. Naufragamos sem praia e na solidão dos botos afundamos. É tentação a vertigem e também a pirueta dos ébrios. Eternos, eternos miseravelmente, o relógio no pulso é nosso confidente. Mas eu não quero, senão, ser eterno. Que os séculos apodreçam e não reste mais do que uma essência, ou nem isso. E que eu desapareça, mas que fique este chão varrido onde pousou uma sombra. E que não fique o chão, nem fique a sombra, mas que a precisão urgente de ser eterno boi como uma esponja no caos. E entre oceanos de nada gera um ritmo. So here is a work of Mario Navarro from Chile, and it's about a, a dream of Stafford Beer. Um, it's a, a professor uh, invited to come to Chile. He was invited by Salvador Allende in, uh, in, in 1973 to come to, uh, to Chile to help uh, to concretize uh, a project of uh, so-called cyber scene. This was supposed to be a cybernetical management of the Chilean revolution. So you could see uh, from a, a controlling room, you could see in real time what are the needs of the different sectors of society and you could respond to them 
almost simultaneously. So this was an alternative to, to a planned economy for this uh, socialist project in Chile. And Mario Navarro made a, a video uh, where uh, Stafford Beer, a fictional uh, Stafford Beer is playing, and also developed a logo for this cyber scene project. And I wanted to take this chance to read to Stafford Beer because we had also a, a project in Portugal uh, shortly after uh, the attempt in Chile, we tried also at some point to, to build a socialist society and we had the same problem. We also needed at some point uh, a cybernetical planning at the service uh, of the revolution, at the service of the popular power. So I'm, I'm going to read it from um, a book by Helga Novak a German writer who has been in Portugal in the cooperative of Torbella, an occupied uh, property. What criteria did the occupiers use to select those farm workers who now work and also partially live in Torbella? Answer. The only criterion was the one of need. Those who needed the most work have been selected, which means the poorest but the poorest were also those whose whole life had to be changed immediately. A change that even affected their health. We have a high percentage of alcoholic people whose reflexes have long been diminished. Wine used to be a pillar of exploitation here and was considered a source of calories. Question, in which area is the legacy of the past the hardest to deal with? Answer, fascism was not limited to abstract terms. As a concrete reality, it influenced human coexistence. Fascism tried to turn each Portuguese into a self-contained island. According to the motto, do not unite, leave politics to us. It is dangerous to deal with it anyway. Question, how does the transition from a hierarchically structured work organization to a cooperative one take place? Answer, it is a very difficult transition. Before, the worker accepted hierarchy and believed that he was a free man beyond the orders of his superior, that he could or not accept his orders, that he could submit to them more or less. In contrast, collective work implies self-organization and self-discipline. Therefore, the worker initially feels much more involved in his work than he used to under the hierarchical structure with the boss at the top. So people feel constrained. They say, the cooperative in front of us, the cooperative in the back, always only the cooperative. That's ridiculous. The emotional realization of full personal development is violated every day by the weight of the collective project. That's very tough. Question, how does the left revolutionary movement in Portugal answer its problems through the daily exercise of popular power? Answer. We are at war against fascism, against capitalism, imperialism, against our own mistakes, which are a product of fascism, against the malice of machines, against mediocrity, etc. All of this can replace or delay armed struggle for the time being. What we are not spared is the everyday confrontation. The physical confrontation will be a celebration, like for example the face of the occupation was. But the most difficult thing is not the implementation of actions, but their preparation. The hardest part is the inability to face our difficulties, the doubts, all the fears. Most people would like to take up the guns and fight right away. But that's what we call cowboyism. Question. Even if you take its experimental character into account, would you describe the Torbella cooperative as a place of popular power? Answer. People's power is not when the workers put their property under the control of the state and thus certain administrators. People's power is alone when production as well as the distribution of its fruits is in the hands of the workers themselves. In this sense, the cooperatives must be in close contact with one another and people's power must be jointly organized. And yet, there will be a state body for global planning which will be developed by the producers themselves on a local and regional level. Such coordination is necessary in order to, according to the momentary needs, 
determine the geographical sectors in which this or that will be produced. It should also be noted that, according to their culture and training, our technicians today are the sons of the privileged, the bourgeoisie, but without technical cadres who work politically, there will be no popular power. And then I've also been thinking of this work from Tanya Widman, a very recent work from 2020, but I uh, have had the chance to see it for the first time here at the Kunsthalle Wien. I've been also thinking about it since the last time I had the chance to, to visit the show, before, shortly before it closed. And uh, this work called V, it's like V from Vanessa, this is a, a very, um, it's a, a very funny Vanessa. Uh, Vanessa made uh, a graffiti. Uh, he, she's uh, she scratched her name Vanessa into a work of uh, Nair Bagramian in the in the last Venice Biennial. So in this culture, um, maybe I imagine maybe with a key, uh, Vanessa inscribed her name into this uh, artwork. And Tanya Wittmann took her mobile phone and she made a picture of, now of Nair Bagremia's work, but of uh, Vanessa and Nair Bagremia's work. And she uh, used uh, some fragments of this picture. You can see here, you can read it, Va Vanessa, no? You can see, you can recognize the name in the, in the fragments. And she has printed it in a, in a normal uh, printing uh, machine, uh, office printing machine. She printed these uh, photos, these mobile phone photos, into the pages of, uh, of a rare uh, catalog of uh, Wade Guton. So, so very um, valuable book. So this is a, this is a work about value and it's an essay about, about value itself, how, about how value is destroyed, uh, produced, uh, newly produced, reproduced. It's, um, it, it's also very uh, beautiful work visually. It's also, I think it's also very assisting in the way how you are tempted to, to read it. And for this work, I thought, uh, I've read the, the curatorial text as well, and it makes a reference to, to the flaneur of Walter Benjamin. And then I thought I, it could be good to give it a try to, to read some of the passages of the flaneur, to read it to, to V, to V from Vanessa, and, and to see how, how, they, how they work together. So this is about the flaneur, also from the arcades project of Walter Benjamin, and it's about the flaneur and, and value, and about his, his empathy uh, with value itself. The social base of flanerie is journalism. As flaneur, the literary man ventures into the marketplace to sell himself. Just so, but that by no means exhausts the social side of flanerie. We know, says Marx, that the value of each commodity is determined by the quantity of labor materialized in its use value, by the working time socially necessary for its production. The journalist, as flaneur, behaves as if he too were aware of this. The number of work hours socially necessary for the production of his particular working energy is, in fact, relatively high. Insofar as he makes it his business 
to let his hours of leisure on the boulevard appear as part of this work time, he multiplies the later and thereby the value of his own labor. In his eyes, and often also in the eyes of his bosses, such value has something fantastic about it. Naturally, this would not be the case if he were not in the privileged position of making the work time necessary for the production of his use value available to a general and public review by passing that time on the boulevard and thus, as it were, exhibiting it. In the person of the flaneur, the intelligentsia becomes acquainted with the marketplace. It surrenders itself to the market, thinking merely to look around, but in fact, it is already seeking a buyer. In this intermediate stage, in which it still has patrons, but is starting to bend to the demands of the market in the guise of the feuilleton, it constitutes the bohème. Empathy with the commodity is fundamental empathy with exchange value itself. The flaneur is the virtuoso of this empathy. He takes the concept of marketability itself for a stroll, just as his final ambit is the department store, his last incarnation is the sandwich man. And here we have the work of Lily Renaud de Var. I want all the above to be the sun. And this is a work uh, from 2020. It's a, a site specific work uh, that uh, Lily Renaud de Var has made at the uh, Tabacalera, at the Center for Contemporary Culture in San Sebastián, Donostia, in Spain, where the first iteration of the exhibition Cybernetics of the Poor took place. And this is a very big cultural center. It's also embedded in the life of the city. Uh, it's a space of transition, but it's also a place with uh, different compartments, different spaces that have specific functions. There is a, there is a cinema, there is a postgraduate school, there is an exhibition space, there is a restaurant, there are meeting places, there are several uh, infrastructures. And Lili Renaud de Var, she makes a exploration of this space through, through her body and through her dancing. So she makes a, a kind of a, of a modulation of, of this space. And for this work, I would like to to read a part from the postscript on the Societies of Control uh, by Gilles Deleuze. Foucault located the disciplinary societies in the 18th and 19th centuries. They reached their height at the outset of the 20th. They initiate the organization of vast spaces of enclosure. The individual never ceases passing from one closed environment to another, each having its own laws. First the family, then the school. You are no longer in your family. 
then the barracks. You are no longer at school, then the factory. From time to time, the hospital, possibly the prison, the preeminent instance of the closed environment. The different internments or spaces of enclosure through which the individual passes are independent variables. Each time one is supposed to start from zero. And although a common language for all these places exists, it is analogical. On the other hand, the different control mechanisms are inseparable variations, forming a system of variable geometry, the language of it which is numerical, which doesn't necessarily mean binary. Enclosures are molds, distinct castings, but controls are modulation, like a self-deforming cast that will continuously change from one moment to the other, or like a sieve whose mesh will transmute from point to point. We no longer find ourselves dealing with the mass individual pair. Individuals have become individuals. And masses, samples, data, markets or banks. Perhaps it is money that expresses the distinction between the societies, the two societies best. Since discipline always referred back to minted money that locks gold in as numerical standard, while control related to floating rates of exchange, modulated according to a rate established by a set of standard currencies. The old monetary mole is the animal of the spaces of enclosure. But the serpent, in the system under which we live, but also in our manner of living and in our relations with others, the disciplinary, the disciplinary man was a discontinuous producer of energy, but the man of control is undulatory, in orbit, in a continuous network, Everywhere, surfing has already replaced the older sports. <laughs>